It's a real pleasure to be here. I, I do not have PowerPoint, but I have something better. It's almost over. Okay. <laughs> so I thought I might um, invite everybody to St. Olaf College in Minnesota. If you, like Jeffrey, are interested in Kierkegaard, we have recreated his library there. And it's a terrific place for undergraduates or senior scholars. Come and join us in January at 20 below zero, <laughs> and we'll see what we can do. Um, I thought I would. Uh, address the meaning of life, just giving, putting people a little bit more in the picture philosophically about the field itself. Uh, just to, to round it out, this is interdisciplinary, and so I can report from my side of the fence a bit on what's been going on. Uh, secondly, I'd like to just connect my presentation with uh, the speakers who have gone before. So I will be um, first on the meaning of life, then a little bit on Gabriel Gar Marcel, and then the sight of our lives, trying to, or I will argue, that it's important in a comprehensive um, search for the meaning of life to take the great world religions seriously. And I was very glad that Crystal, Par Crystal Park's observations on the strong correlation between uh, meaning among religious believers and Frank Mortella's presentation also um, stressed how the retreat of religion and in a way the naturalization of the sciences also fueled a lot of attention to the, the meaning of life. Uh, I'll try to defend a view eventually that is, takes a, both a subjective and an objective view. Um, Samantha Heitzelman's excellent presentation where she locates meaning and values found in ordinary life, and I will, I will try to amplify that also. Roy um, Baumeister's talk, just fabulous. And uh, I am actually I am a Cartesian dualist, unfortunately. I'm like Banquo in Macbeth or something. You're like, oh no, he's here. <laughs> but uh, you know, you might use the word pluralism, actually, meaning there's just more than what's disclosed in the natural sciences. and. Um, and Jeff, I've already said, yeah, just great talk. So until recently, um, about the 1980s, the meaning of life in the English-speaking world, as opposed to the continent, but among the Anglophone philosophers, was neglected largely because it was thought to be a category mistake. Propositions have meaning, but life itself? There's an a apocryphal story that Bertrand Russell was in a cab in London, and the cab driver said, what's it all about? Or something like that. And he apparently went into ap apoplexy, just not, well, we don't ask those questions. Um, also, there was the complaint, I'll just be brief here, but there was the complaint that having a meaning of life was in some ways um, overarching and um, detracting from creativity and invention, the free, our freedom as persons. Sartre and de Beauvoir were quite into that. But um, it seems to me that all along, it's made sense to talk about the meaning of events, meaning in events, uh, just as you were pointing out brilliantly, I, if ideas are not causally efficacious, who would explain us being here now? Um, so with the meaning of this gathering, easily, is this a graduation ceremony? I don't think so. Um, so we, we've been talking about meaning all along. And Russell, God bless him, uh, he was holding forth on the meaning of life at, even at this time. He wrote The Worship of a Free Man. What is the meaning of life? We live in a godless universe. Uh, this planet is going to become incinerated. The Milky Way is going to run into Andromeda. It's, it's absolute death all around. That was his, he had a view on the meaning of things. So. Meaning was here to stay. The other thing I would point to about reviving interest in the meaning of life was the revival of virtue theory. This is you know, Anscombe, McIntyre, other familiar names. But virtue theory really invites um, discourse on what do our lives amount to, and we can, can we critically reflect on the, the value of what we take to be virtues and vices. So that was quite big. And then, um, I think I'm going to skip 
two others. <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll mention one more, um, two more actually. One was the part of the um, recent development, it was more anti-utilitarian, but a number of philosophers, Bernard Williams, Susan Wolfe, um, started to argue that your life has a meaning and a good. It's first personal, but it that can overcome the domination of ethics. They looked at a field that was largely utilitarian, which would require most of us not to be here, but to be out, um, you know, doing famine relief and um, you know, addressing preventable deaths. But we find things worthwhile that resist this kind of demand. And that required us to come up with accounts of, of meaning. The other group I would like to draw your attention to, I say, with some Cambridge Platonism. I'm doing it because we're in Cambridge. And the Cambridge Platonists were mid 17th century philosophers. Uh, they got it all right, in my view. It's been downhill ever since, but some of us have been continuing with them. They and we located meaning in being embodied persons, their understanding of the goodness of human nature. I mentioned them, uh, bringing them in here, partly because while they preceded Harvard, who founded Harvard, um, they, um, the, a lot of Harvard um, students came from Emmanuel College where they, where they flourished in Cambridge. Also, while Carlyle may have been the first person in English to use the word meaning of life, the Cambridge Platonists were the first ones to use many of the words we use today in philosophy. First ones to use the word consciousness. First ones to use the word philosophy of religion, theism, naturalism. These were the first philosophers to do English in a sustained way. So we, we owe a lot to them. Now what they thought of embodiment was we, don't, we just don't, in an able-bodied person, see, think, feel, act, and so on. We have what they would call the virtue of seeing, the virtue of motility, the virtue of reason. Now this is not virtue in a moral sense like justice and courage. These are non-moral goods. And in fact, they might actually be necessary for you to be really bad. To use a line from G.K. Chesterton, somebody who could shoot their grandmother a mile away was a good shot. But that's about the only thing you could say that was good about it. Um, but they understood, as we do not in philosophy of mind, that philosophy of mind we are obsessed with is thinking the same as neurology and, and so on and so forth. Um, but we don't really think, unless we're doing medical ethics, of the good of embodiment that our embodiment consists of a harmony of non-moral goods. That's the, the, so meaning is found, and this is back to, in a way, uh, Samantha's point, is found in our ordinary interaction. And it's not just intellectual or sensorial. That is, it, it strikes me that if you live in alienation from yourself, let's say you are um, alienated from your sexual orientation, your race, your gender, in a sense, you are not fully embodied, that is on their view. You have to, as it were, incorporate yourself, your body, into your life as a, as a good uh, being. Making the transition to Gabriel Marcel, I would say, uh, his dates are 1889 to 1973. He gave the uh, 1962, 63 William James lectures here. Um, he thought that meaning is largely a matter, in a first-person sense, of being at home with yourself, a kind of self-habitation. And in my mind, with my students, um, some of them are not at home with themselves. They're not fully inhabiting what they say. Um, so I've sometimes told students that uh, when they graduate, and the process of coming home to yourself may not be in place. I, I say to them, you may be uh, thinking of yourself as traveling, but I'd say you're homeward bound. That is, coming home to who you actually are is a big part of authenticity. Now, there are a lot of other philosophers that will say that, uh, Simone Weil and, and so on, um, Sartre and so on. But it, it seems to me that Marcel had a lot to say on, on this that was terrific. And Jeffrey, who probably, I, I think you know French phenomenology well enough, but his notion of creative fidelity would be a nice um, mirror there. Now, uh, on this notion of self-habitation, I'm now making a transition to 
uh, the third point. As Thoreau said, what is the use of a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? So the big question to me is, where is your house? And here I suggest uh, we really need to take in the big cosmic pictures. That is, if Bertrand Russell is, is right, then for myself, I'm, in the, I'm a Christian philosopher in the Abrahamic faith, I'm basically wasting my time. There, there's a sense in which when I um, pray, I'm not really praying to a being. I'm pr praying to an image. Perhaps even you know, for a Bachian one, so an indirectly I'm re relating and ricocheting off the world. But I'm making a terrible mistake. It's just awful. And it's, it seems to me, I mean, you could live an upward and, and you know, a loving life, as a, whether, whether as, a, as a Christian, Jew Muslim, or secular naturalist, and so on. It's still the case that it, it strikes me that it's absolutely foundational about whether these worldviews are correct. So if Buddhism is correct, and I'm totally into self-acquisitiveness and fame and absolutely narcissistic vanity, I'm basically pursuing an illusion. It's completely illusory. If Christianity is, is correct, then when you are loving another person, and we'll, I'm going to get into love. I'll give you an analysis of love as not monkey. Well, I have a higher view of monkeys, I think, than you do. Uh, definitely of dogs. Dogs are not solipsists. I think that slide of yours shows that they're not. Cats are probably solipsists, but not dogs. In any case, um, when you have the three highest loves, and for those of us in the social Trinitarian view, we believe the three highest loves are self-love, love of another, and love of two for a third. The illustration that I use sometimes in laying this out is Coleridge and Wordsworth. When they both were young, they loved themselves, they loved each other, and they loved the English language, and you got romantic poetry. When cocaine <laughs> atrophied um, Coleridge's self-love and Wordsworth became incredibly vain, they lost their love, the, the poetry suffered tremendously. And so if this view of the Trinity is correct, and on this view, the interior glory of God, God is more like a community than a homogenous thing. Basically, the world, the cosmos, even Alpha Centauri, is the result of the inner glory of God manifested in the world. On this view, being is actually good, just actually being. Um, so what I submit to you, the meaning of your loving another person and your loving a third thing is actually enhanced, or it's certainly differently situated than if you think um, Jacques Monod or early Russell is, is correct. So I suggest... And, and here, on this point, I, I take uh, the position, which we could discuss, I take it that um, world religions have tremendous unity around the golden rule, greed is always bad, and, and so on. But I do take it that there are differences uh, between the religions. Ah, I wanted to say something more about love. How much time do I have? F five minutes? OK, we'll, we'll go really quick. Those of us in this tradition, informed by the notion of the Trinity, believe that love consists of a benef is beneficent love and unitive love. You love the good of the other, and you desire to be united to the other. And this is spelled out in the whole kind of Christian spiritual tradition of purgation, um, illumination, and unity. And it's very, very important because it's focused on a person. And I'll, I'll just make this as a Simple point, but many of us, uh, I think, are in relationships where we're not really loving the person, but we're loving the love that we're receiving from the person. And when you do that, you're not going to be able to experience the highest form of love, which is unreciprocal love. I think when you can love somebody after they've stopped loving you, that's a tremendous achievement. And that's really anchored in a kind of spirituality with a long history, which I commend to you. I'm going to present four objections to myself and then reply to them. Okay. <laughs> One, I, I have described embodiment in terms of what is of the good and a realistic view of ethics. Why not a more neutral, say, Humean view of embodiment? We love embodiment because we desire to, to do, do things. Besides, don't some religions treat our very embodiment not as a good, but as an obstacle to salvation or enlightenment? 
Oh, I wrote, I wrote here, a full reply is impossible. <laughs> okay. In brief, but given time, I would advance the platonic thesis that events or things are desired because they are good rather than vice versa. Arguably, each of us has reasons for desiring things that, as it happens, we do not desire. And many of us have desires um, we should not. I'll just, for the sake of philosophers that are here and, and just for sake of compression, I'm more with Parfit than Blackburn on this, so just really brief. And um, besides, uh, many of the religions which do shun the body actually shun our current bodies, not a re-embodiment. Even Jains will believe in the re-embodiment on the level of knowledge, bliss, and joy. So they're not putting down embodiment per se. And besides, those of us who love being embodied, um, it's embodiment is a time-enclosed good. That is, certain goods, even the orga orgasm machine, which you brought up twice, very interesting. But I would say even sex is time enclosed. I mean, after a century or whatever, you're going to want to unplug, do some gardening, and then go right back in. So I'd say even this conference is a time enclosed good. No matter how funny, how great, how, after a month, we're going to go, let's take a walk. <laughs> you know. But I would say that, um, yeah, our embodiment is time enclosed. But is a person time enclosed? That is, can you exhaust a person the way you would exhaust a conversation? I don't think so. Uh, second, why? Um, okay. Oh, 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 really? Okay. Why think religions are chiefly a matter of providing true or false sights, worldviews? Didn't Wittgenstein teach us that religions are more a way of life rather than worldviews? I'm inclined to think that Wittgenstein did teach us many, many things, but that it's very hard to construct a robust account of why religious practitioners do what they do without actually having a belief in the reality of, of what, they're, what they believe they're addressing. Third, um, experts disagree about the nature, plausibility, and truth of the great religious and secular worldviews. Why take them seriously when thinking about the meaning of life? Well, if we were going to take the criter criterion of consensus by philosophers, we would not be able to believe much of anything about love and what really matters to us. Um, however, what I would say is now um, it is much easier, thanks to technology, to have access to the great world religions and their teaching and the secular naturalistic alternatives than ever before in human history. I'd say being able to speak English would be, a, be the most accessible passport here. I say that because the, knowing there's more people speak English for whom it's a second language than a first, but most of the philosophy, philosophical work, have been translated into English than any other language so far. So if you know English and you can get on the website, you can have access to all of the cases for all of these religions. There's a philosopher who used to say, in philosophy, there's no shallow end. There's only the deep end. <laughs> My view is there's always a shallow end. In other words, if you can't explain Kant, get, get, get somebody in the picture of what Kant believes are human, 10, 15, 20 minutes, get them started. You know, hey, let's go back to the drawing board. So what I would say is, right now, uh, for non-experts, you will be able to, you currently have access the greatest access in world history right now to these, to these arguments. Final, very quick point. Well, these world religions have excited uh, conflict among each other. Why should we uh, d dirty the waters here? Well, in some cases, very highly publicized cases, but I'll, I'll just do two quick personal things. That I have found, as a philosopher, my big thing has been Christian-Muslim relations. And so uh, last I was in Tehran, fabulous meeting and real bridge, be bridge building um, between persons. And another um, point where philosophers can help, as well as sociologists and psychologists, in terms of um, criticism in university life. So I'm part of a group connected with Uppsala University, they have a very large immigrant Muslim population. And they're dealing with this problem. How do we critically engage Islam without people taking it personally as an attack on one's life? As a, and so this is, a, this is not a done deal. This is a thing where philosophers, psychologists, and sociologists can have a role in trying to um, bring about fruitful cooperation. Thanks for coming. <laughs>